show you our meeting today and just confirm that <laughs> myself as chair, Tony Buchanan, Morris Bradley, Sinead Bradley, Jerry Carroll, Rosemary Barton, and Gary are all here via Starleaf. Can I just remind members to put um, phones on silent and also if you can just mute your screens unless you're actually speaking just so that we don't get feedback. Thank you. Um, so apologies, we have ap apologies from John O'Dowd and can the clerk confirm if we have any um, delegated votes? Yes, Chair. Um, John O'Dowd has delegated his vote to yourself uh, and that's the only delegated vote that we have for today. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate that. So our first item, our second item then is the draft minutes of the previous meeting. If members are content to agree those. Confirmation, okay. Agree. Agree. Matters arising then. Members will recall that at our last meeting, the committee agreed to reconsider amending Stanton orders to introduce the hybrid proceedings in the Assembly Chamber. Subsequently, I wrote to Speaker to advise him of the committee's decision and to arrange an informal meeting with officials from the Assembly Commission. A response from the Speaker is at page 10 of your meeting pack. In the response, the Speaker agrees that it is right for the committee to reconsider this and has also asked his officials to begin looking into hybrid proceedings. He also draws attention to the significant impact on managing business from the Chair with hybrid plenaries which might include new speakers' rulings. The speaker has also indicated that other institutes have introduced hybrid plenaries and experienced technological and procedural difficulties with this. Therefore, I would propose that the clerk arranges contact with the other legislatures to take account of the problems they have had, just so that hopefully, if we are able to put this in place, that we learn from others' mistakes and, and we're able to be pre-prepared and, and hopefully don't make the same mistakes, but inevitably with any of these things, there will be glitches. So that may involve um, informal meetings via, via Starleaf and to give evidence on the issue. Party whips should also be informed of the committee's deliberations and potential changes to operations when we are in a position to, de to do so. Are members content? Sinead? Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, Chair, I, I, I am content, but I've given this some thought and I was reading through the papers um, from other jurisdictions and areas. And one of the one of the considerations that came to my mind, and I'm sure all members will appreciate this, is whilst the procedure might be well and good, we are talking about delivering this in Parliament buildings and it is an old building. And we all know what the Wi-Fi connection is like in the building. So it may be worth at the outset engaging with the IS office as well, um, so that we really are creating a process that will be deliverable in that building, just to have an understanding of what might need to be done. Well, I, I have already raised that, those issues with the, the clerk, Sinead, and, and I've actually asked them the clerk to, to bottom out, is it even possible? because potentially you would have to make um, changes within the chamber that may that may well not be possible to do. And you're right, we are in an old building. It's, um, I suppose, not amenable to, to, to many of the things that we're having to do at the moment. And there could, there could be potential difficulties around it. So I have said to the clerk that we would need to, we would need to delve further into those issues first. Um, alongside, not, not first actually, sorry, in, in conjunction with and alongside looking at what other legislatures are doing and whether it's possible. Do, do any other members have any comments they want to make at this stage, Jerry? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, just, just for kind of your and, and the committee's benefit, um, I've contacted the Commission um, about introducing uh, technology so uh, members and ministers can Zoom or Starleaf or, or join in when they're isolating. And, I think it was it was quite it was before this happened, but it was quite stark. There, was it two weeks ago, there was like four ministers isolating, um, and it was obviously that's because of the seriousness of the pandemic. But it was quite remarkable, and I think most of them were were 
were were sick, were well and they weren't on well of just following the guidelines and most of them were, were all working but they couldn't partake in assembly business and it was, it was quite strange to be frank and obviously the, the justice minister had her um her proceedings uh, delayed around the uh, abuse bill um so I, I would definitely be for exploring this um i know obviously uh, you probably were as well uh, in, the, in the Doyle that they've moved between uh, the convention centre, which is like near Doyle and somewhere. Um, so generally speaking, I'd be for, um, obviously, if the chamber can be accommodated, uh, can, can accommodate ministers to isolate, um, to you know, remote in or to call in, but also with, like, is there a possibility of another room in the, the apartment buildings or the Department of Health or, or somewhere on the ground? So. Uh, I would generally be, be for exploring that uh, if that can be conveyed as well. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely, Jerry, and, and I'm, I'm all for innovation and, and anybody, anybody's thoughts around these issues. And I do think all, all things will have to be explored because you're right in relation to the, the ministers and, and not being able to move really important pieces of legislation. And that was through, as you said, no fault of their own. They're, they're following the guidelines and doing the right thing. So it, it, I think it did become more of an urgent issue whenever it started to have that kind of impact on ministers because whilst every member in this assembly is extremely important, we can't move legislation, only ministers can do that. And I'm aware that you know other ministers offered to do that, but I mean, with something as complex as the domestic abuse bill, something as absolutely vitally important to get right, I don't think it would have been fair to have asked any other minister to do that. And I think it was important that the, the Justice Minister dealt with that issue. So whilst obviously appreciating the efforts of other ministers to um, accommodate the Assembly. So I, I, I think this is something that we do need to look at. And I mean, the clerk has, has, they has spoken to me about the fact that they see it as something that could become a real emerging issue as well. So I, I think it is something we probably are going to have to move on fairly quickly and hopefully um, we will be able to do it within the chamber but we'll have to look at all options because we can't have business held up every time every time a minister has to isolate. I would agree I would agree with you to a certain extent mm -hmm. but I do think I do think that it must be used as a last resort. I don't think it's instead of ministers appearing in the chamber. I think the first option is appearing in the chamber. Absolutely, Rosemary, and that would always be the case. And I think, to be fair to ministers, they wouldn't want to not be in the chamber. I think ministers would much prefer being in the chamber. So it, it, it would absolutely be, be used in circumstances where there's no other option open to them. Okay, are members content then that we, we, we move on with the pro I think we Morris, proceed with the proposal? Did Morris, Morris, did you want to come in? Sorry. Sorry, sorry, Chair. No, I I would agree that uh, we need to harness new technology if and when we can. But uh, the situation is storming. The thickness of the walls, depending where your office is at within storming, and depending on the strength of your broadband if you're uh, logging in from home, are all factors that we need to take account of. And, so, and yeah, those will. Yeah, absolutely. And those will be the challenges. And and hopefully we will have staff there that will be able to look into all that and and come back with real proposals that are absolutely doable and possible. Because if we're going to have hybrid proceedings in the plenary, you know, in, in the assembly settings, we can't have legislation moving where you're having all sorts of technological glitches and hitches. So, you know, whilst we have to deal with some of those things, we don't want it to be a constant where, where people are coming in and out and, and falling in and out because of poor broadband. So if people are content, then we'll move forward with exploring what can be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, Gary, just in relation to you raised an, an issue at the last meeting around the 9.30 deadline for nominating a proxy. And that's obviously in relation to the temporary provisions. So if you're content, the clerk is going to give us a, a wee bit of an update on that. Is that okay, Gary? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Much appreciated. Thank you, Chair. Um, so yeah, just to recap then for uh, members' benefit, um, Gary had raised an issue that under the new temporary standing order 1112, um, part eight of that standing order says that notice to 
say that you want your vote to be proxied to another member must be given in the Speaker's office no later than 9.30am on a sitting day. And I think Gary had queried as to what happens if a member um, has to leave the building or self-isolate on a sitting day after 9.30. Does that mean that to a certain extent their vote is lost because it can't be proxied to somebody else? Um, so I spoke to officials uh, about this because obviously the standing order is fairly fairly um, blunt in what it says there and provides provides a deadline. And I think one of the things we have to do is think about the context in which the standing order was created back in March. And back in March, it wasn't really about what has now become the big issue of self-isolation uh, through restriction. It was all about social distancing at that point. And the standing order was there. The proxy voting standing order was to, to try and stop lots of members being in the confined space of the lobbies and also being in the confined space of the chamber. So it was envi envisaged at that point that, oh sorry, it wasn't envisaged at that point that there may be occasions when members who thought they were going to be in the building for that day then wouldn't be in the building for that day because of restrictions that then came into place after March, talking about if a member is um, identified on track and trace or has had close contact with somebody else, um, that they then must actually self-isolate and potentially leave the building. So I think it's a fair point that has been raised that potentially that does inhibit a member who, through no fault of their own, and let's say that they are moving a private member's motion on um, a plenary afternoon, so therefore they don't proxy their vote because they know they're going to be in the building, suddenly find that mid-morning or even early afternoon that they get some sort of notification from the PHA or from the Track and Trace app to say that they must now self-isolate. Under the regulations, they're compelled then to, to leave the building and to go somewhere else, probably to their home. And the standing order didn't really foresee that happening. So I think it is something that the committee could look at in terms of, of trying to, uh, to update. And there are, if, with, if you don't mind, Chair, there are a couple of ways in which I suggest the committee could do that. Um, firstly, the committee could choose to actually amend that standing order, so look at standing order 11128 and actually change it, not to say, not to change the deadline, because I think in the majority of cases the deadline is required so that officials in the business office can actually get all of the proxy votes um, recorded and sorted out, because potentially you could have your first vote, let's say on a, on a Tuesday at 10.33 if there was a business motion. And so you could end up having a division very quickly. So it allows a bit of time for officials to actually make sure that they have all of the right recorded proxies for that day. However, we could put in an amendment to that to say that if a member through COVID restriction has to leave the building, then they could approach the speaker or write to the speaker and make that case to say that they are um, that they've missed that deadline, they were intending to be in the building that day, and that um, can their proxy vote then actually be, uh, be, be, um, be given to the Speaker's office after the half-nine deadline. Um, so that's one option, and that's quite a prescriptive thing to do. The other option is actually not to change the standing order as such, but the, the committee writes to the Speaker and basically explains what it is that we've been looking at here and sets out the case for when it may be that a member misses that half nine deadline when they weren't intending to proxy but then under current covid restrictions are forced to leave the building and at that point the, the speaker could reissue guidance and use their discretion or his discretion to say okay because of this particular circumstance i will allow notice for that proxy vote to be given to someone else um, so I think those are really the two options that, that the committee has if they choose to actually do something about that. But that's the background really to it. So I think, Chair, it would, be, it would really be up to the committee how they want to proceed with that. Yeah, th thank you for that, Nick. Appreciate your, your brief. I, suppose, I, I would like to obviously let Gary in because he had raised this, but I would also like to let Gary comment on this because I want to establish is this a bigger impact on, on those smaller parties and, and independents? So, Gary, I'll let you, you speak first, but I'd like to hear your views on this as well, Gerry. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to Nick for that. Uh, I do appreciate it. I think, well, both of those options obviously are options, but, uh, you know, to me, um, you know, writing to the Speaker may be um, appropriate uh, as a first option. I, I think that the Speaker 
uh, will show, well, I, I, can, I can't speak on his behalf, but he, he seems to be showing some you know, flexibility in terms of trying to uh, make people, um, I suppose, uh, be able to conduct business in this COVID environment. So I think that if we write to him and set out the case, in my opinion, um, I, I think it's welcome. It is for those COVID uh, situations where people are having to leave uh, post uh, 9.30. Um, and obviously we'll hear from, and I appreciate that there are some concerns around independence, and I think we need to take all of that on board as well. So it's not about sort of pushing that to the side. I think if we're, if we're going to send something to the Speaker, that we can bring all of these issues uh, forward. But I, th I suppose it's just trying to get away um, forward that's maybe straightforward rather than having to go through a lengthy process. Yeah, and I think you're right. Right into the speaker, hopefully, would resolve it. And my reason for thinking that this might have a that it's a good point and actually might have a bigger impact on on the independence is because many of the parties designate automatically their votes, you know, to the whip, whereas that's not the case for smaller parties and independents. So I think that that and and all of this, obviously, we want to make sure that everybody has has an equal opportunity to to place put their vote on the on the record. Jerry, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, thanks, Chair. It is very, very relevant. Um, I was in a situation a few weeks ago where I had to leave um, Stormont because um, I got a, a notification and it was after half nine and I had no, obviously, uh, it wasn't, I don't know if there was any divisions on that day, but I was unable to vote or cast my uh, proxy. So uh, and I could see a situation where uh, some of the smaller parties and independents uh, and individual MLAs uh, of parties, of smaller parties, could get a, a notification as you indicated, um, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, or last night, maybe six or seven o'clock, and there's uh, there's divisions uh, very late in the in the morning. So, yeah, um, I suppose my preference, I don't really know what, what, what's the best option, Chair, sure, but I think something that allows either speaker's discretion or something that allows for um, after half, the half nine ruling to be relaxed if somebody gets a notification on that day, um, I don't know how to how to frame it, but in terms in broad terms, I think um, it makes sense to have something. Uh, something there. Yeah, I suppose my my reason for thinking that we go for the the speaker is that it's it's the easier way and more straightforward, simple, and probably the quicker. Just being frank about it, rather than having to to change that in order. So, um, and if it's able to be done that way, then that's ideal. And and I think you're right. To be fair, like. There's, there is a number of pieces of legislation going to be coming before the Assembly and I want to make sure, and as does everybody else I'm sure, and, and the Speaker and everybody else in the House would want to make sure that every single member gets the best opportunity to vote and if members are following the guidelines because they're isolating, I think that it would be extremely unfortunate if they didn't get the opportunity to put their, their vote on the record. And the half nine deadline does present some issues. I understand why it has to be there and I actually do agree with it because I think we have to be fair to the staff, but there has to be some flexibility around it. And, and that's why I wanted your views on it because, and I didn't actually even know that, that you had had to isolate, but it just does highlight again then the problem and the issue. And if there had been something coming up on that day that had been um, a very important vote for you personally, then obviously your opportunity to place that vote would have been removed. So, sure. Can, can we, can we just, just can we, as a suggestion, can we emphasize to the speaker about uh, flexibility in a extenuating circumstances? I mean, can it be as as broad as that, or does it have to be more more specific in terms of his his ruling? Uh, well, we can find out. I think I think that could be problematic. The, the isolation one's very easy, and and I think would be, would we get much get it much easier to get agreement across the house on it. To be, to be fair, Jerry, but I understand what you're saying. I know that, I mean, I could have to leave the chamber because the child's on my own and, and I have to go home to her, but, um, and, and, you know, many other and smaller parties would be in the same position. I'm, I'm just not sure if we would get agreement across the house on that one. But, I mean, Nick, what's your view? I would, I would appreciate the clerk's view in relation to it. Gary, I know you're looking at it. I'll, I'll let you back in now. Thanks, Jay. I, th I think that under the specific reason with regard to the fact that there is legislation that says that if a member 
receives a notification to say that they have been in close contact with somebody who's tested positive, they are compelled to leave the building. And it's not really a decision that the member is making for whatever other reason. And so um, the, the way that I had looked at it when Gary had raised the original query was really from that point of view that under COVID restrictions, there is perhaps a bit of a wrinkle within the standing order that we could we could bottom out and, and ask the Speaker to, to show some flexibility. But I, I, that was really how I'd looked at it. I think if you started to open it up to any circumstances or other circumstances where a member may have to leave the building, I think that changes that quite significantly. And if we wanted to go down that route, I would suggest that that would be more actually a change to the standing order in terms of the deadline because I'm not sure how you would put that into guidelines as such. I, I thought that was probably the case. Thank you for, for that. Can I let Gary come in, Jerry, and then I'll let you come back in if you're, if you're wanting back in? No, Go thanks, ahead, Jerry. It was on that line that Nick has um, <clears throat> just articulated. I think that um, I suppose what, what I've first seen in this situation was around the COVID. I think it's very clear cut if you have to leave the building for that reason. I think the speaker would be reluctant to get into a situation where um, you know, he was almost making a judgment call in terms of maybe the seriousness of why someone would have to leave. So, you know, or do you need to provide a, um, some sort of medical evidence to suggest, for example, that you, you know, you're not going to be there for a certain reason. All of those types of scenarios, I think, is, it's much more clear cut if it's COVID and you have to leave the building. I think that, you know, for me, that that would be the way forward. And um, but but I think there could be a wider piece of work they looked at around proxies in general, as we know what, what we're going to do anyway. But as I say, this is just a short term fix, um, which I don't foresee many people using. By the way, I hope and pray that nobody has to use it. But it's in the case of somebody gets the ping in their phone that. At least there's something there for them. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Just just before you come back in, um, obviously we are going to be speaking about the the proxy voting in general on, on the next item, and um, I want to get your views on that anyway because I want them placed on the record. I know that you didn't get the opportunity to respond, but I think your views should be placed on the record. So, do you want to make your comments now or as part of that? Thanks, sure. I'll hold off till then. Thanks. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay. Do, do any other members want in on this particular item or are we content to move on to the next item of business? Okay, no, nobody's shouting at me that I've missed somebody putting their hand up so I'm going to go on to the next item of business which is um, agenda item 4 which is around the proxy voting. And members will know that the committee agreed to receive a briefing from research on the proxy voting on proxy voting and um, there's a clerk's memo summarising the responses at page 13 of your packs. At page 17 is the paper from research. The responses received from parties and independent members are pages 42 to 90. And Jerry, do you want to, to put your, your own comments on the record now or would you like to do that after the briefing? I could do it after the briefing, Jerry, if that's okay. Thanks. That's fine. Yeah. Brilliant. So, can I welcome? I can't see who's there, but I'm hoping that I'm welcoming Ray to the meeting to brief us, brief the committee on his paper. Yes, Chair, that's right. Yeah. Yes, I see you know. Thank you. Yeah. So, I'm just going to let you go ahead. Thank you for coming to, to brief us today, Ray, and I'm just going to let you go and give us your, your, brief, your brief outline. Okay, uh, thanks, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Um, so the research looked at any permanent proxy voting procedures in other legislatures, as well as any temporary arrangements uh, introduced as a result of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so to provide context and comparative information, sorry, I'm just getting a notification here on screen, but I'll ignore it. Uh, so to provide context and comparative information, the research looked at what measures, if any, are in place in other legislatures. Um, this included the legislatures in the UK and Ireland, uh, along with relevant international examples. Um, and of course, as members know, uh, legislatures have not been immune to the impact of COVID. Uh, many legislatures around the world have put in place temporary provisions to allow, uh, insofar as possible, the continuing functioning of legislative business. Um, so turning first to the House of Commons, uh, and this was probably the most complex case to examine, 
Uh, the changes introduced in the Commons at the beginning of the public health crisis uh, have been subject really to political deliberation and, controver and controversy in a way that um, I suppose other legislatures have largely uh, avoided. Um, it also seems to be quite a sort of fluid and fast changing scenario in the Commons, but I'll, I'll try to highlight, highlight the key points. Um, so back in February 2018, the Commons passed a resolution uh, that members who have had a baby or adopted a child should, for a period of time, be allowed to cast their vote in the House by proxy. And this had really come from a, an independent report called The Good Parliament, uh, which had looked at ways to make Parliament uh, and other legislatures more accessible. So following that resolution, the Procedure Committee set out uh, in a May 2018 report how proxy voting arrangements for prevent parental absence might work in practice. Uh, and it found that there were no procedural uh, impediments to the introduction of a proxy voting scheme for parental reasons. Uh, subsequently, in January 2019, the House approved pilot arrangements for members with parental responsibilities and the necessary temporary modifications to standing orders were approved to allow that scheme to operate. Uh, now, the Procedure Committee was directed to review the arrangements after 12 months, but two unexpected events extended this time frame. First was the general election in 2019. The second was the COVID crisis early in 2020. So the new procedure committee was granted an extension to its report uh, until September 2020. And that report ended up including two main aspects, proxy voting for parental absence and proxy voting for absences due to COVID-19. Uh, and proxy voting related to COVID had been introduced in June 2020. So in its eventual report, the Procedure Committee was largely positive about the proxy voting scheme uh, in relation to parental absence. Uh, it stated that it had been to the benefit of parliamentary democracy and that it was a step towards closing the motherhood gap and should encourage women to consider a parliamentary career uh, where they otherwise might have been dissuaded. The committee recommended that the House make proxy voting for parental absence permanent uh, with some technical modifications. Uh, these are set out in the briefing paper. Um, so, for example, as a result of the committee's report, uh, members could self-certify for a proxy vote for parental absence rather than having to provide supporting documentation. And really the key provisions in the scheme in terms of duration of proxy votes for parental absence and uh, eligibility are uh, it applies for seven months uh, for the biological mother of a baby or for the primary or single adopter of a baby or child, of which a maximum of one month shall be taken before the due date or adoption date and a maximum of six months after the due date or adoption date. Two weeks for the biological father of a baby, uh, the partner of the person giving birth or the second adopter of a baby or child. Um, a member is also eligible for a proxy vote in circumstances where there have been complications relating to childbirth. Uh, in these circumstances, the speaker will determine the arrangements that apply in this situation, including the duration of the proxy vote uh, in consultation with the member concerned. So moving on to provisions for proxy voting for public health reasons, uh, the Commons had originally introduced hybrid proceedings in April uh, of this year, which had allowed for remote voting. Um, but on the 12th of May, the Leader of the House announced the government's intention not to renew these provisions. And this was viewed by some as disadvantaging uh, some members who, for example, were shielding at home. So on 4th of June, the government introduced a new proposal that proxy voting would be allowed for members at high risk from coronavirus for reasons that they are either clinically extremely vulnerable or clinically vulnerable. Um, but again, it was felt that this didn't go far enough. So a revised proxy scheme was introduced for members who were shielding for health reasons. Um, and the Speaker made it clear that members who had applied for a proxy vote had given a clear commitment that they were unable to attend Westminster. The Procedure Committee felt that this approach was reasonable and it also commented on the duration of the scheme. It recognised that the health crisis was likely to persist um, and it actually highlighted local lockdowns and the various guidance issued by the devolved governments and recommended that proxy voting for public health reasons should continue for as long as guidance and statutory provisions restrict members' travel to Westminster. So, on the 23rd of September, the House of Commons agreed to make voting by proxy for parental absence permanent, and also agreed to extend proxy voting for reasons related to the pandemic. These were further, uh, issues related to the pandemic were further extended until 31st of March, 2021. 
and the briefing paper sets out the standing order providing for proxy voting. Uh, that's at figure two in the briefing paper. Um, the actual scheme, the proxy voting scheme, um, as of November 2020, um, sets out how proxy votes are designated and how they should, should be exercised. So just those a few key points in relation to proxy voting for public health reasons. The scheme essentially oper operates on trust. Members are not required to provide proof uh, or evidence to the speaker of their need for a proxy vote. Uh, in effect, they obtain a proxy vote by writing to the speaker to say that they do not wish to vote in person for medical or public health reasons related to the pandemic. Proxy votes for public health reasons last until the expiration of the temporary standing order or until the House otherwise orders. A member may nominate no more than one proxy at a time, although the proxy can be changed, and the proxy must act in strict accordance with the wishes of the member who designated them as their proxy. Proxy voting on public bill committees and select committees is not permissible. Uh, the procedure committee anticipated that in the normal course of events, a member who takes a paternity absence will be replaced either temporarily uh, or permanently. Turning to the Scottish Parliament, to date it hasn't introduced proxy voting arrangements uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, nor did it, did it have in place a proxy voting scheme for parental absence. Uh, now, in March of this year, the convener of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee corresponded with all MSPs to seek their views on the possibility of a proxy voting scheme. This had uh, actually been originally prompted by a letter to the committee by a, a member asking it to consider the introduction of such a scheme. Um, and of course, at the time, that, that was completely unrelated to, to COVID. Uh, the Scottish Parliament hasn't progressed this issue. Um, but it has, of course, introduced a suite of measures to allow the functioning of, of parliamentary business during COVID. Um, this includes virtual question times and the introduction of digital voting. Um, but it, it is probably likely that, that they'll revisit the issue of um, proxy voting at, at a later date. Turning to the Walsh Parliament, um, November 2019, the Business Committee of the National Assembly for Wales, as it was then known, agreed to look at the issue of proxy voting in two stages. So firstly, to consider impl implementing it for parental leave only. And secondly, to look at the possibility of extending it to long-term illness and other carrying responsibilities. And that's interesting because that's pre-COVID, but they're already looking at sort of at around health issues. Um, in January 2020, it was agreed to introduce proxy voting for parental absence until the end of the current mandate. And subsequently in March, the proposed changes to standing orders were agreed and accompanying the guidance was produced. And just very quickly, the key points uh, of the scheme, uh, it introduces a proxy voting procedure in the uh, Assembly, or Parliament now, for members who are absent from the Parliament for reasons of childbirth, care of an infant or child, uh, as a result of a new adoption or surrogacy arrangement, or the, who have suffered a miscarriage or stillbirth. The speaker must be informed and any requested documentation must be produced. Um, proxy votes are available for all plenary or committee of the whole assembly, uh, except where motions or resolutions are required to be passed by at least two thirds of the total number of assembly seats. Um, proxy votes cannot count towards the quorum, um, and this is also the position in the House of Commons. Uh, the maximum durations for proxy votes, uh, similar to the House of Commons, six months for the biological mother of a baby, uh, primary or single adopter of a baby or child, or the primary or single care of the baby or child in surrogacy arrangement. Um, two weeks in other circumstances, for example, the biological father or the father of the, or the partner of the person giving birth. Sorry. And these proxy voting arrangements will cease to have effect on the 6th of April, 2021. Mm -hmm. The Republic of Ireland, um, Dolly Ireland has no provision for proxy voting. Um, at the beginning of the, the COVID crisis, the clerk of Dolly Ireland received legal advice to the effect that remote or virtual proceedings um, were precluded due to Article 15 of the Constitution, which states that the houses of the Oireachtas uh, shall sit in or near the city of Dublin uh, or in such other place as they may from time to time determine. Um, so on those occasions where all members of the Doyle have to be present, for example, the election of the Taoiseach, the Doyle meets at the Dublin Convention Centre, as a member alluded to earlier. And when it meets in Leinster House, voting is either by voice, vote or roll call with members remaining in their seats. 
Uh, the usual manual vote where members walk through the lobbies was not in use. Um, and just to place that, that issue of proxy voting into the further context, um, because I just think it's useful sort of the different sort of cultural uh, approaches to it in, in different legislatures. Members may recall the, the controversy that Doyle was embroiled in last October um, when it emerged that members, um, some members had been voting on behalf of colleagues using the electronic uh, voting system located at each seat. And a subsequent, a subsequent report by the clerk um, highlighted Article 15.11.1 um, of the Constitutions, which states that all questions in each House shall, save as otherwise provided by the Constitution, be determined by a majority of the votes of the members present in voting. And it was interesting that that report's conclusions stated that the practice of voting on behalf of other members did not align with this constitutional requirement. And it was actually reinforced during an interview with one of those members who had been caught up in that controversy, where it was explicitly stated that the constitution doesn't make provision for, for proxy voting. Um, so there, there's very little room for argument or negotiation there. Um, it doesn't seem likely that you could anticipate proxy voting being introduced in the Doyle uh, really at any time in the near future. Um, Chair, just very quickly, two international examples of relevance, uh, New Zealand and Australia. Um, New Zealand has a relatively long history of proxy voting, dating back to 1996. It has been amended to suit the circumstances of COVID-19. Um, it's a fairly sort of wide-ranging and liberal scheme to begin with. Um, a lot of the New Zealand concept of proxy voting is tied to the party votes. It doesn't have any real application in the context of the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, but personal proxy votes um, are wide ranging in scope, um, very few restrictions, it cannot be recorded for a member who has not taken the oath um, of allegiance, uh, nor can it be recorded if the member is actually present in the chamber. Um, but if a member is in a part of the house from which it is impossible to vote, such as in the gallery, uh, they can have a vote recorded by proxy. Um, it's open in character, it applies to all business for an indefinite period. Um, and really the, the changes introduced as a result of COVID go back to impacting on, on party proxy votes. Uh, and as I say, they, they aren't really applicable uh, in the context of the assembly. But again, there are no proxy votes uh, allowed in committee meetings. Um, just very quickly, the Australian House of Representatives. Um, in 2008, introduced special provisions for nursing mothers in circumstances where they were unable to attend the chamber. Um, proxy votes could be given to the chief government whip in the case of a government member and to the chief opposition whip in the case of a non-government member. Um, but what's interesting there is that the resolution also expressed the opinion that the special provisions should not be extended or adapted to apply to members not able to be present in the chamber for other reasons. So was, the focus of it was very narrow. Um, and this sort of kind of cultural resistance on the part of some members actually emerged in that procedure committee's report when it considered the issue in 2007. And at that stage, some members actually expressed concern about setting a precedent for wider application of proxy voting. Um, but just as a side note to that, in 2015, the House of Representatives recommended that members should be allowed to bring infants into the chamber. And this was reflected in a subsequent amendment to standing orders. Um, and the standing order is not age specific uh, in relation to the infant or gender specific in relation to, to the member. Um, but there has been no move to add in any flexibility to the proxy voting arrangements to take account of the COVID crisis. So, Chair, those are the main issues I wanted to, to highlight. We, there's really two distinct issues. To what extent is some form of permanent proxy voting scheme desirable for new parents and issues related to adoption and complications with pregnancy? And then the separate issue of the public health crisis. Just one final point, the Procedure Committee in the House of Commons has committed to examining whether there should be other grounds for qualifying for a proxy vote once arrangements for proxy voting for public health reasons have ended. And I think that might be interesting sort of to keep an eye on to see what further recommendations that committee might make in the future in terms of maybe extending the proxy voting scheme beyond parental absence. So, Chair, thank you. I'm happy to try to deal with any questions that members may have. Thank you, Ray. I appreciate the, the briefing. Um, that was an excellent briefing. I'm just wondering, um, in relation to the, the, the Scottish um, 
situation where they haven't done any form of of proxy voting and obviously you said they have they have the electronic voting don't they yeah they do they do they have a a lot i mean they, they've had electronic voting i think pretty much since day one to her. okay okay and then just in relation to the urine have there, been, have there been any issues raised? Obviously, there were there issues in the doll, but that wasn't around proxy voting. That was around voting for somebody where it had not been authorised and there was no nothing there within, as you said, within the rules to allow them or procedures to allow them to do so. So that, that was people doing something they shouldn't have been doing. That's a separate issue. But in relation to actually where there is proxy voting in place, has there been any evidence of it being abused in any of the legislatures that you're aware of? I mean... I mean, if you're not aware of it, fair enough. But no, I'm not aware of it, Chair. The only thing I, I've noticed in the last week, uh, a couple of articles saying that uh, in relation to the House of Commons, there's a concern that it places too much power in the hands of the whips. They're getting the vast majority of proxy votes. Um, that's to some people is not desirable. Other people may not see it as a, a problem. But that's uh, an issue that was highlighted in. Um, uh, one of the newspapers within the last week, but in terms of actual abuse of the system, no, I'm, I'm not aware of any of the legislatures having having that issue. Chair. Yeah, and and if you have to, I get what they're saying about placing too much power in the hands of the whips, but you have to give them that power. They they can't take it from you. You have to designate your vote. Am I right in saying that? Yes, that's that's right. Yes, yes. So that's a choice that people people are making. Yeah. So so you're. You wouldn't give your vote to somebody, you wouldn't designate your vote to somebody if you didn't expect them to vote in the manner in which you were going to vote anyway. I mean, I don't think anybody would would do that. I'm not saying that it wouldn't happen that somebody would designate their vote thinking that somebody was going to, that's a potential. I think that that's highly unlikely because that could be open to legal challenge and all sorts of things, but you just wouldn't designate your vote if you didn't think that, that the whip was going to vote in the manner in which you so I think that's a kind of I, I would be resistant to that. I think that's somebody flying a cage somewhere. And um, it's yeah. something that's not had in it. Yes, go ahead, Ray. No, sorry, Trey. No, I, th- I think you're right. I mean the whips are going to have power anyway. It was an issue raised. I think it was in the, the telegraph and I'm, I'm not sure really what the, the actual concerns were around it. Um I, maybe some people just don't like the party whips having too much power, but you have to you have to give it to them as well as 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 still the case. I am very keen that this is looked at. I have been raising this for a number of years before I was ever elected. I've been raising this about how we expected to get more um and, and you've alluded to it Ray in your in your presentation, your briefing. Um how we expect to get more young women who are, you know, having having babies, having children and their partners, but also those who are long term sick. But we know the real gap is getting young women into politics and whenever we do get them in, it's then keeping them because if, if they do, then do have children and they find that, it's, that that's just too much of a responsibility, either not taking any maternity leave, which many, many don't, or taking it and feeling that you've let down your party and your constituents and, and you know, on, on specific issues where you weren't in the chamber to vote. So I think that it is an issue that needs to be addressed. And I can, I, I can shout it from the rooftops now, I feel, at a time I maybe couldn't have in case people would have thought it was some kind of self-interest. But given my age, I think I'm, I'm past the... <laughs> past the years when it would have been of self-interest, it's, it certainly is for the interest of others and for ensuring that we have diversity within our chamber and ensuring that nobody who wants to be part of political life is prevented from doing so because they also have children and whether that's, you know, they're adopting children, which I actually think is probably something I hadn't thought through, but is, is equally an issue, you know, and and a number of people who have adopted children and have been able to get obviously that that leave from work and I think it's very important and sometimes nearly more important because depending on what stage those children are coming to and they can have very comp- often very complex needs as we know so I think that this is an issue that we do need to address and 
I'm going to stop my comments there and allow other members to come in. Jerry, I see your hand up. Thanks, sure. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Tom. Um Just two questions. I don't know if you can answer it, but just uh, I thought I would uh, I'd ask while you're here. Um, I mean, obviously, New Zealand sounds sounds like the, the, the sort of the system that I would generally prefer. Um, has there been any? I'm just thinking that you know, if you're a foil MLA um, and you have to go down the Glen Chain Pass, and if there's a extreme weather, then you may be stranded. You may have four or five MLA stranded for a period of time. Uh, if you're aware in New Zealand, was there any consideration of sort of environmental concerns around people being potentially unable to travel um, in, in extreme weather conditions or you know increased? Uh, water levels or anything of that nature, if you were. And just secondly, um, I think obviously for me, maybe it's a, it's a bigger issue obviously in England, but um, it appears that obviously this would be beneficial to people who aren't in the capital or aren't in the, the, the city where the, the parliament or the assembly is in. So if you're in Manchester, you, you know, traveling to London uh, is it's quite a quite a trip in Glasgow even further. So. Are you aware, Ray, of much sort of conversation? Like I said, it may be more applicable to England. Much conversation around sort of a um, non-capital centric approach. If that's not too too much of a of a tongue twister around this uh, issue, thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, in terms of the first one about weather, I I don't know. I I didn't come across that in any of the literature related to New Zealand. It could have come up in debates, you know, parliamentary debates, perhaps, but I'm not aware of it. Um, in terms of the people's location, well, uh, the procedure committee did allude to um, members having to travel from other parts of the UK, and alluded to local lockdowns and how these could vary, um, which I think is actually becoming more pertinent, actually. Um, that one part of the UK could be in lockdown while another isn't. And that's really, it's important to keep the proxy voting scheme related to COVID going for as long as possible. Um, and I, I think there was that awareness of people traveling from Northern Ireland, traveling down down to Scotland as well. Um, so that, that is something that the procedure committee had picked up on. Thank you. Do any other members want to ask questions of Ray? Okay. Um, Ray, thank you very much. Really appreciate you giving us that briefing. Um, sure. We may well back you, have you back on this issue <laughs> if we have specifics, but, but I really appreciate that. That has been helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, members. Thank you. So, Jerry, I know you asked some questions of of Ray, but I also want to give you this opportunity just to place on the record your own views around the the proxy voting issue. I suppose just to, to highlight for yourself, I do think that I mean I will be my suggestion will be that we ask um the clerk to bring forward some option bring forward an options paper. And I think as part of that we would have to ask that we specifically look at um, smaller parties and, and independents, but I think that we would like to hear from yourself so that the clerk is clear about what the concerns are in relation to, to, to people like yourself. Yeah, so, thanks, Chair. I appreciate that. And obviously, as I sort of alluded to previously, it's not always possible for ourselves to respond to everything, but I appreciate um, the opportunity to, to comment on it. I mean, from, from my uh, from our party perspective, we want to see as, as uh, widely available system of proxy voting as possible to be uh, to be honest about it uh, we think sort of the current arrangement is obviously quite um, limited um, in terms of uh, it's only existing for the, the COVID period it doesn't allow for people uh, with current responsibilities or people with, with the health emergencies or people who cannot travel or there's um, restrictions on travel for uh, like I, I alluded to environmental reasons or uh, reasons for consistency emergencies or you can list uh, uh, an arms uh, length uh, list of them. Um, so, so we would generally be, be for a, a enhanced system of, of proxy vote where it allows members to uh, use it, um, use, their pro use their proxy vote uh, as much as possible. Um, we, uh, I mean, I, I also would be, and that's speaking on our behalf, but I, I also notice um, 
uh, Claire Sugden's comments, and, and I think they need to be reflected in the in the procedure. Um, and I, I think was it Australia or Scotland? One of the one of the systems had a um, system where you could essentially log in, give a, a PIN number, and cast your vote. As in, you vote effectively online. Was my understanding of it. Um, so I think something of that nature may deal with the independents uh, or the parties who do not want to um, uh, allocate their, their vote. Um, it may raise for us as an issue as well. Um, I just, just finally, I mean, that was uh, during lockdown. I remember being on a, um, in, in a car, traveling, but taking part in a, in a party meeting and conference and voting online on Zoom. So obviously we need to be a bit more security conscious maybe for for uh, for legislation but i think if we can have something which is a bit more uh, flexible um we would uh, support that so um yeah that would be my general uh, points chair thanks so no thank you appreciate that jerry the more views we have on this the the better and then we'll hopefully the options will reflect everybody's everybody's views jerry you were looking back in thanks chair no it's on the proxy issue i think that First of all, that, that presentation was very useful in terms of reading piece. Uh, I think there's reading all of the responses from all of the parties um, and, and, the, and the independents as well, and hearing Jerry's views. Uh, I think there's a consensus in the, the sense that you know we accept that the current status quo, uh, or the, the status quo prior to March, uh, I think we all, we all want to see change in terms of proxy voting. We want to see progress on that. Uh, the issue for me um, would be around, uh, and well, this the options paper, no doubt will bring this out, but it's for me, it, it needs to be clear in terms of what basis proxy votes uh, would be used for. So the, the, the reasons you've outlined, the Chair, absolutely, I can really understand those. And I think that that's important that, that those are addressed and that proxy voting can be used in that case. But I also want to... Uh, uh, somebody from file, you know, don't get me wrong, there's many a times uh, I would quite like to be sitting in my own office and, and voting, um, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the assembly from my office. But at the same time, we are members of the Legislative Assembly and we want to ensure that, you know, MLAs do not, and I'm not suggesting for moment anybody in this call be in this situation, but where MLAs don't feel the need to go to the Assembly at all. Um, and I'm not suggesting anyone would, would try to advocate that. But proxy voting, in my opinion, should have specific criteria in terms of when that can be used. Um, and obviously, the options paper will bring that out. Yeah. Um. I suppose was anyone else looking back in there? Because I don't. I don't want to. Uh, yes, Linda. I would. I would like to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. You haven't got, I see you haven't got a, a reply from the Ulster Unionist Party, but I can, I can say that we're quite happy with the status, with the present situation in relation to proxy voting during the pandemic. But again, we would have reservations, like Gary, would have, we would have reservations for its long-term use. Certainly, we'd be supportive in relation to maternity leave and paternity leave and issues of long-term illness. That's not an issue for the party at all. These things happen and we've got to be supportive of them. But again, like Gary has said, we believe our duty is in store. We're elected to the Assembly as, as Legislative Assembly and uh, that's where we would, we would have a concern about proxy voting rather than sitting at home, we should be in Stormont using it, doing it voting in person. Okay, thank you. Um, I see Jerry has left the screen, so I, I'm, I'm not going to comment any further because I think that we should um, get the options paper and then have further discussions around this. I, I do think that it's, it's something that should be. Am I still with people? Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. My, my screen's frozen just then, and that's okay. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I I suppose I'm not going to give any further commentary around it, other than to wait for the options paper to come forward, so that we can sort of have, have a direction that we're focusing on and commenting around. Um. So are are people happy enough that their their views for now are on the record, and we'll have a further 
further discussion around this whenever we get the options paper from the clerk. Yeah. 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 Okay. Everybody else content with that? Chair? Yeah. 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 Sorry. My screen has frozen so I can hear you, but I can't see you. So you'll have to, you'll have to speak up. Chair, you want to hear me? Sorry, there may be one other issue that the, the uh, clerk could look at. You named, uh, you named, for, uh, you named the adoption name for people in all the wrong term second off. Maybe we need to look at those who are from foster children as well. Another issue yeah. that maybe could be tied into it whenever you're tied in the, the adoption part of it. Okay. I, I, I'm not restrictive on it at all. I think that's absolutely um, 100%. I would be content with that to be looked at also. The chair, sorry, just before we, we move on, just Rosemary, for, for your yeah. benefit, uh, the UUP did actually uh, put in a submission on it, but it was yeah. a joint one with member statements, so it's actually in the member statements part of the pack, but it does outline what you've said, that maternity, yeah. paternity, long-term illness, and used in exceptional or prescribed reasons. So just to let you know, that the part the party did actually put a, put a, a submission in for it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I actually thought that all the parties had, apart from Jerry, so I don't want Jerry to be thinking I'd be giving him special treatment. Um, so next, the next item on the agenda then is in, in item number five, member statements. And the committee has received responses from the parties on member statements. Uh, page 93 of your pack is a cover and memo from the clerk which summarises the responses. A page is 98 to 102 are the responses received. And a page three of the tabled items is a response from people before profit. Although it appears most parties are keen on the idea of introducing new procedures in some form or another, there are widespread concerns in introducing them in the current circumstances surrounding COVID when pressures on the assembly time already exists. And obviously that is increasing. So, I mean, I'm, I'm open to hearing members' opinions in relation to this, but I would be of the view that we would consider, consider putting member statements on hold, and only on hold. I mean, we, we could go down the road of saying, you know, we, we've looked into it and this is a cut-off point, but I don't think that's appropriate because we decided we wanted to look at this, and I don't think we have fully bottomed it out. <clears throat> However, I do think in the current circumstances, it's difficult to get the opportunity to do that. And I would propose that we would park it, but only park it, until we are able to, to get a better focus back on it. Obviously, we have the LCMs to deal with and the um, proxy voting as well. So, I mean, I, I would like to hear members views on that, if they're content that that's what we do, or if they have a, an alternative proposal. Chair, I'm, I'm happy to second that. I think that, again, reading all of the party's responses, or certainly the majority of them, um, certainly the foot's on the door, the door's not shut by any means, and I think that we need to um, park that issue in the meantime and come back with it at a later date. Okay, thank you. Listen, just if there's members looking in and I'm not seeing you putting your hand up, just take come off mute and let me know because I, I'm screaming phrases sometimes and I don't want to miss somebody that wanted to make a contribution. So, is everybody content with that proposal? Yep. Yeah. I haven't heard anything else, so I'm hoping I haven't missed somebody. So, if the clerk is content then that that's how we will move forward in relation to the member's statements. Nick, are you content with that? Yeah, so I think because because it is a, an inquiry that we're looking at, what we'll have to do as a committee is just um, write to the speaker, because it was the speaker that wrote to us about this issue in the first place, and just write to the speaker to explain that, as the committee have agreed today, under the current circumstances with COVID, it's an issue that we are going to come back to, but perhaps when the restrictions have abated a little bit and we have a bit more time to then consider it properly and the Assembly's not under the time pressure it is now. So uh, we'll draft a letter to the Speaker, which we'll bring back to the committee for the ne at the next meeting, if that's okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, right. 
what I would suggest is obviously the parties have already given their views. We have those views on the record. And when we come back to it, we'll have the views. We don't need to ask parties for views again, although that does not prohibit any party from feeding in additional views if, it, if their views in relation to any of it has changed. Is that okay? Yeah. We're going to move on to agenda item six. Oh my God. I never lost it again. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah, but you can't see me. Or you can? Yep. You can. Yes. I just can't see you, so that's all right. Um, so, item agenda six, agenda item meeting six, the LCMs. Members, you recall that the committee wrote to the statutory committees, parties, and independent members to take their views on the LCM procedure. A number of committees have responded, as have Sinn Fein and the Alliance Party. A page 105 of your pack is a clerk's covering memo, which summarises the responses received. At pages 112 to 140 are the responses received. Given that a number of parties on the committee have not provided um, your views, I would propose that we defer consideration of the responses and give um, other parties the opportunity to provide their views for the next meeting. I would prefer that we have, if possible, and I understand there may be some parties and, and individuals that, that may not want to respond to this, but I'd like to give the, the utmost opportunity for everyone to have a, a view. So are members content that we come back, back to this at, the, at our next meeting? And we will be proceeding with it at that point. So obviously that gives um, parties and individuals two weeks to respond to it. Are members content? Yep. Okay. Okay, thank you. Everybody's okay with that. I'm, I'm going to assume I haven't heard any dissenting views. So just to let the clerk know that, then we, we would like that put on the agenda for the next meeting. Yes. Um, to, give, to give members and, and individuals an opportunity to respond to that because I realise there were a number of issues. I mean, we're asking around proxy vote and we're asking around member statements. So I know it can be difficult to get responses back when you're asking for a number of things at the one time. So I think it's only fair to give people another another couple of weeks to respond to that, okay? No problem, Chair, that's great. Thank you. Agenda item seven then is correspondence. The only item of correspondence within the, the pack was the speaker's letter that was already dealt with in matters arising. Um, so we don't have any other correspondence. Item seven is our forward work programme. Um, members there are only two meetings left this year before the Christmas recess, so we need to give we need to give consideration obviously obviously to the options around the proxy voting and then continuing our ongoing work on the LCMs. Just to make members aware that obviously there is the emerging issue of the hybrid proceedings in the assembly chamber, so this might come back to us over the next couple of weeks. It might be a, a very quickly. Um, I suppose quickly emerging and, and maybe need to be dealt with more quickly than we would have expected. So I just want to flag that up for members so that if it does come back onto our agenda and we're being asked to deal with it, that, that they're not saying where, where did this come out of? I thought this would have been dealing with the other issues first. So are members content with that? And I think we did have an agreed position that, that it is something that we do want to we do want to deal with. I, Agenda item eight then is chairperson's business. And I have some chairperson's business. Agenda item nine is any other business. Do any other members have anything they want to raise? Uh, my screen is frozen again, so I would suggest if you have anything you want to raise, shout at me. No. Okay, th thank you. Agenda item 10 then, members would be happy to hear, is the date and time of our next meeting which is Wednesday the 2nd of December at 2.30 in room 29. I thank you all for attending today and I'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.